All right, time to go for a Wrangle walkabout today. Yep, we want to show you a little bit about what's in town. Welcome aboard our home and trawler, Sea Venture. Join us and the crew as we travel, explore, and experience all the world has to offer. We hope your time with us entertains, inspires you to live the life of your dreams. If we can do it, you can do it. So let's cast off the lines and head out for our next adventure. Heritage Harbor has been our winter home and it has worked out very well for us. It is located about a mile outside of town with Sea Level Seafoods, a processing plant also located in the harbor. Before we head into town, let's get you a little bit oriented. Here is Heritage Harbor, Reliance Harbor, and then the downtown area. And at the upper left, you can see the airport for those who fly in. When we want to walk into town, we head north on Zamovia for a very short distance, and then we cut down to Case Street, which takes us around the Reliance Harbor. Here is a view of the Reliance Harbor from the south end looking north. You can see town across the way, but it has been a favorite stop of ours because we can see the Stikine ice fields in the distance. After this stop, we continued along around K Street to our first destination, Shakes Island. We're at Shakes Island, um, except for at low tide, it's not quite an island. But there's a longhouse here, and I know there's tours here during the summer. I expect it's probably closed now, um, but we'll uh, go take a look. Shakes Island is located in the middle of the Reliance Harbor. As we walked out, you could see the community house, not a longhouse. It was a community house that was rebuilt in 1940. It was refurbished in the methods that the Tlingits used when they created it initially. The ravens are remarkably loud. Listen to them as we walk around this community house. There are a lot of legends dealing with ravens in the Tlingit history, so it's kind of ironic and fitting that they are making their presence known. We're in the Reliance Harbor, the main city harbor here in Wrangell, and they have a tidal grid. A tidal grid is where you can bring your boat at high tide, tie it up to a dock, and as the tide goes out, the boat will sit on the bottom on a bunch of beams, tied fast to the dock, where you can do a bunch of work until the next high tide. So here's the tidal grid here in Wrangell. It's actually two-sided. You can do two boats at once, one on each side. And we have not done this with Sea Venture, but we have pictures of it in the tidal grid where the prior owners did it. So far, I don't have the courage. 
and we haven't had the need. Mostly courage. Still in the Reliance Harbor looking out of the harbor. Out of ring and what you can see. It is so gorgeous here. The view is so great. It's uh, you know, when it's not pouring down rain, it's a January view. But really why we're filming is I wanted to show you this. Maybe the sun's in the way. There's another one over there. We have no idea how you do this. It's got control swing left and right, boom up and down, the extension in and out, and the winch up and down. So guys with fish boats, the commercial fish boats, they come line up, tie up at the dock here, and operate these controls and put nets on and off their boat and equipment on and off their boat. And it's all, com there's two of them, and it's all completely self-serve free. It's, way it's low tide, so. Okay, the water's like 30 feet down right now, Woo. so you might do it at high tide. But how interesting. We're standing in front of the Nolan Center and we're getting ready to go check it out. There's a museum and a huge bookstore, um, but we've never seen it and we've heard really good things about it. So come on, let's go. Check out the bear. These bears are all over town. Here is the overlook. They have some replicas for doing rubbings. 
and they ask you not to do rubbings on the actual petroglyphs down at the beach. Petroglyphs are designs or symbols carved into rocks. No one really knows who carved these, but they believe they were some form of early expression or documentation. So we've come to Petroglyph Beach on a cold winter day, 26 degrees, about 15 knots of wind. We're gonna call the wind chill factor damn cold. <laughs> and trying to find the petroglyphs. Yeah, there's a little bit of one there. We know they're not that easy to find. Wrangell has the highest concentration of petroglyphs in Southeast Alaska. Petroglyph Beach is located really close to downtown. It's about a half a mile walk, so it's easy to get to. It's a lot of fun to search around and try to find the petroglyphs on the beach. It's like a treasure hunt. There are over 40 petroglyphs on the beach. It's a good idea to come when it's not high tide, so you have plenty of room to look around. Even though it was cold, we had a lot of fun on our visit to the beach. Hey everybody. Hello. Welcome to Wrangell. At least the overlook over Wrangell. Mount Dewey. Mount Dewey. Woohoo. We climbed to the top of the local mountain. Okay, it's a four tenths of a mile walk on a boardwalk. But it's oh. mostly steps. It's all steps, yes. <laughs> In the snow. In the snow. Sweet. Let's see if I can find Sea Venture. Oops. Right there. Somewhere in that vicinity is Sea Venture. Are the way in here? No. Town looks pretty, blanketed yeah. in snow. Volunteer Park is located close to downtown. It has baseball fields and some really nice walking trails. It's very popular with dog walkers. Here at the ball fields in Wrangell, it brings back memories. 
because uh, the first time we ever came to Wrangell by on our own boat was in 2006, now 15 years ago. And we were at the harbor master's office and asked him, you know, what is there to do in Wrangell? And they said, oh, well, tonight it's go to the baseball game. So we sat right here on these bleachers and watched the high school baseball game. Now here in Wrangell, there's one high school, obviously. It's a town of 2,200 people. For a high school baseball game, if they're gonna play Juno or Sitka or Ketchikan, uh, the other team flies here, comes to the airport, plays the game, and flies home. That's how high school sports are done here. They still do it, but they have to fly everywhere for every game. And I think it's just remarkable the community puts it together and makes it all happen, but still 15 years later, I remember how much fun we had watching the local baseball game. And a big part of the town, I think, turned out for the game and had a great time. Well, that wraps up our tour of things to do in Wrangell. Stay tuned now for our Bulbous Bow Q&A. All right, time for a Q&A. We haven't done one in a while, and this one is all gonna focus on the Bulbous Bow because lots of questions about the Bulbous Bow. So let's get going. Question number one, why is the Bulbous Bow filled with water? because we didn't want it filled with air because that makes it too buoyant and would make a lot of resonating kind of sound. So it's filled with seawater by a hole being drilled in the top and a hole being drilled in the bottom. It's just flooded. Question number two, which comes from the fact that the bulbous bow is filled with seawater. What about stuff growing inside the bulbous bow? Well, so there's a barrier coat and bottom paint done on the inside of the bulbous bow, but uh, for things to grow, a couple things have to happen. Uh, there needs to be water movement and light. And inside the bulbous bow, there's very little. So when they've removed bulbous bows, actually when boats have crashed into things and then they had to be replaced, it turned out there wasn't much growth going on inside. In addition to that, the directions we've been given is when we haul the boat out of the water, of course, all the water will drain out of the bulbous bow. Then you plug the bottom and you fill it with a bleach water solution and sit there while you're out of the water. And that would kill what might ever be inside a little bit. All right, another question we're getting a lot of, how's the bulbous bow working so far? So far, it seems to be working great. The boat still clearly pitches, but the pitching is a lot slower motion, or it's a, I want to say slower, it's a gentler motion. It's not as jerky, and it doesn't want to lift you out of your seat in larger seas. But the bow seems to stay up really well, uh, and so that all seems to be really good. The other question about how's it working is, is it impacting our speed? And I think clearly it has increased our speed a little bit. And I think it's coming from two sources. Uh, one is it's keeping the bow down and that's the weight of the water coming up over the top of the bulbous bow when you're cruising in calm water, keeps the bow down or keeps the stern up and the trim of the boat is better. Thus we're displacing less water, less weight, burning less fuel to maintain the same speed or going a little bit faster. Or when it, the bulbous bow is really performing in larger seas and we're pitching, we're not pitching up as high and we're not pitching down as low as in the water as we were before. And when we go down before and you hit a wave, the boat kind of decelerates, slows way up and then speeds up going up a wave and then slows up when it hits a wave. And that variance seems to be reduced and the amount of deceleration is less because the bulb the bow is actually going down in the water less with the bulbous bow than it did before the last question that we've got a lot of is what about anchoring does the does the anchor like plop down on it or something so the top of the bulbous bow is really uh pretty thick about three or three and a half inches thick so but the anchor does not hit the bulbous bow it goes down about a foot in front of it and so that doesn't seem to be a problem at all we do have our big bridle that comes across the middle uh, when we're anchored and the bridle uh, by just looking at it looks like it does sometimes can rub on 
on it, the rope sections. And so I don't think that's going to harm anything or do anything. We can't hear anything. Maybe it just keeps the nose of it like a little cleaner for us or something. I don't know. If that proves to be a problem for some reason in the future, we can always adjust or lengthen the bridle. Uh, but I don't, I don't think it's a problem. So, so far, everything seems to be working really good. All right, so I hope that answers the biggest questions about the bulbous spouse. So until next time, wishing you no wind and flat seas. Bye, everybody.